Good morning. I invite you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians or flip through your phones with me. We're in a new day and age, aren't we? To the book of Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm uh, starting a series or a series of series through the book of Ephesians. So when you come to church and I say turn your Bibles to, you'll automatically know where to go. We're going to go through the book of Ephesians. It'll take us all the way to Easter. And I'm going to break this series down into three different um, series. The first two chapters of Ephesians, I'm going to talk about what it means to be a part of the family of God. And then uh, chapters 3 and 4, I'm going to talk about living out God's mission as a part of his calling on our lives. And then chapters 4 through 6, living in grace in the real world. And as I was looking at that breakdown, I couldn't help but notice it follows what we have on our windows out front. You can't see them unless you see them backwards. Real family, what's it mean to be a part of the family of God? Real purpose, what does it mean to live the mission of God? And right now, how do we live in the world that we live in right now? I love it when stuff like that happens. You're thinking, wow. Well, never mind. As Hannibal used to say on the A-team, I love it when a plan comes together. Well, I'm going to read the first 14 verses from Ephesians chapter 1. Would you please stand out of respect to God in his word? This letter is from Paul by the will of God to be an apostle. An apostle means a messenger, someone sent out to deliver a message, to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Okay, show of hands. Anybody here need grace? Right? Anybody here need peace? Me too. I'll take C, all the above. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. That's like the best verse in the Bible right now for me. I I just can't, I just keep coming back to that verse. Wow. And so we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. And God has now revealed to us his mysterious plan regarding Christ, a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure, and this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work according to his plan. Isn't it good to know that God has a plan? God's purpose was that the Jews who were first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also, or non-Jews, have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance that he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that we would praise and glorify him. May God be praised. This is his word. You may be seated. Uh, An acorn is a great illustration. Uh, It falls to the ground, and the first thing that takes place, I don't know if you could see it, it's clearly in that time-lapse photography, but there's a taproot that 
starts off from that acorn, and then it begins to burrow its way down into the soil. And from that taproot come little, little other roots that spring from that central taproot. Once the taproot is established, then the rest of the, the stem begins to form and begin to go up and up and up. It takes about, what, 60 years for an a oak tree to grow, but once it's strong in its root, its taproot and its roots are developed, then over the 60 years, it can, it can face storms and all kinds of rough, rough environments, and it can thrive. And as I look at this passage, and as we begin to work our way through this, this great book, this is the picture of what uh, God wants for us if we're going to thrive in life. And that is, we've got to be rooted in what's right. And that's why I gave this talk that title today, Getting Rooted in What's in Right. So let's just start in verse 1. I'm going to begin working my way through here. Uh, verse 1 says this letter's from Paul, or the Apostle Paul chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of, of Jesus Christ. And he says that he wrote this letter to the holy people in Ephesus, who are, his faithful, are God's faithful followers. So Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians and probably the surrounding churches uh, to help them to learn how to thrive in Christ. And that is they, first of all, have to get rooted in the unfathomable love of God in Christ. And so this letter was written to new believers as to help them grow spiritually in the face of a pretty rough culture that they lived in. They lived in the Roman and the Greek culture of that day. In many ways, that culture is a clone, or we're a clone of that culture in that day. And so I have a map. And Ephesus is uh, on the western coast of what is now modern-day Turkey today. Uh, Ephesus was the second largest city in the Roman Empire at that time. So in our country, New York City, I believe, is the largest city. Los Angeles is the second largest city. So you've got to kind of picture a city like Los Angeles, if we can understand what it was like back then. It was a leading cultural center of the, of the Roman world, or one of the leading cultural centers. Ephesus had world-class architecture. Uh, it had enormous wealth and great power. And you walk, if you walked around Ephesus, you would see statues, uh, that, and they worship and exalted the human body. And so if you walked around and you saw these statues, these statues would have perfect athletic bodies. They valued what was strong. They valued what was beautiful and perfect. And so if you were beautiful, if you were strong, if you were perfect then you were in. If you weren't, then you were out. In fact, they practiced what was called exposure to, to infants in that day, exposing unwanted, disabled, blemished babies by just taking them up onto a mountainside and just leaving them there to die. It's almost like taking a, a, an infant and putting them in a, in a trash barrel or something like that. And that was practiced. And so in that day, uh, the culture marketed to the masses who mattered and who did not. And in the midst of this, God planted a church, to, like, a, like that acorn, and it's starting to go up, up, up. But Paul wanted to make sure that that taproot was grounded in what was right. If the root was right, everything else is going to be fine. And so... Uh, Verse 2 says that, may God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. And we all raised our hands. Who needs grace? Who needs peace? You know, so he's, he's writing this letter because he desires for people to experience the grace of God and to experience his peace. Like he wants to give them a blessing. What you may not know is that Paul wrote this letter when he was in prison. And you wouldn't know by it. I mean... The, the letter is, is just so positive and so strong. If you look at this letter, you will find out that Paul's letters tend to follow a similar pattern. The first third or the first half 
of uh, one of his letter, he begins talking about just how great God is. He'll talk about God's grace and God's unmerited love and all the privileges that, that we have in Christ. Then he'll transition to uh, practical living in God's grace, living in hostile cultures that just think differently and opposite of, of God's way, just worldly cultures. And so you got the privileges, usually in the first part of his letters, and then you get into the practices, practicing or living out in the grace. And so today, uh, if you're looking for a, a book to read in your own quiet time, you want to start reading the Bible more regularly, I'd say, I'd say Ephesians is great. If your family is looking for a, a book to read together after supper, to have a devotion time, then uh, Ephesians is great. If your small group is looking for a new study, uh, Ephesians is fantastic. So let's talk about being rooted in what's right. What I mean by that is that if we take to heart what Paul is trying to help us to understand and help the, help the people that he was writing to understand, is that it's not just a head knowledge that he wants them to understand. He, he wants it to get to their hearts. Sometimes you can miss the blessings of God by 18 inches because it's in the head but hasn't gotten down to the heart. And so he wants them to understand that your identity or how you define yourself is rooted in the unfathomable love of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, if you're going to thrive in this world, you have to be grounded in God. And so Paul starts at the ground level. And he's saying the ground is that you need to start burrowing down and exploring and drawing nourishment and strength from the love of God. Now, we live in a world that will tell you that your worth is in what you do. And if you're a guy and you meet somebody, typically uh, after a little bit of time, someone will ask the question, so what do you, what do you do? And it depends on who you're talking to, but many times the value, your value will be communicated to them and they'll value by how much money you make and or the prestige of your job. And so if your job isn't very prestigious, you might be able to make up some lost ground by saying, but I make a lot of money. Now, if you're a woman, it gets worse. Because, and I think even more emotionally painful, because not only do you get judged by what you do, but how you look doing it. I mean, a guy can get away with being rich and ugly. Women? Not so much. And so it's like a schoolyard, and, and, and people are picking teams. And there's the cool team. And then there's the, the not-so-cool team. Those who matter and those who, who do not. Who's in? Who's out? And so in the midst of this ugliness comes this refreshing refrain of God's perfect love just over and over and over again, Paul starts at the ground level. He says, guys, 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 you'll, you'll be a basket case if, if you try to deal with what you're in, these harsh conditions. If you don't have that taproot going down in the right thing, if you're not rooted in what's right, you will not thrive. And so I want you to get rooted in the unchanging love of God. So in chapter 1, Paul begins to lay out how good Christian followers have it. Beginning at verse 3, he says, All praise to God, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now, I grew up in Michigan. And my dad graduated from the University of Michigan. And all my family rooted for the University of Michigan. So I didn't have a chance. I mean, I grew up brainwashed to like the University of Michigan. Now I get, I live in Indiana, and I don't, like, throw it in front of your face, and I'd love to see Coach Crean and Coach Painter do well in basketball, but I grew up loving Michigan football, but it hasn't been very good for the Wolverines for the last 10 years. But then the Messiah, little M, came to town. Jim Harbaugh left the 49ers and that dysfunctional organization, and he came to the Wolverines, 
Michigan. And so we got, like, the best coach in football. And so, but the thing about Jim Harbaugh is he's weird. I mean, he's incredibly competitive, but he's odd. So you've got to deal with his weirdness if you're going to get winning. If you want winning, you've got to deal with the weirdness. Well, this, he has, like, these phrases that he uses. And so one of the phrases that he uses comes from his own family growing up. And so he, had a, he had, has a brother, John, who coaches the, the, the Ravens in the NFL, and he's got a sister. And so they live in this two-bedroom house, and they'd be around the, the breakfast table, and his dad, Jack Harbaugh, who is also a football coach, would say to his family, who's got it better than us? And they would reply, nobody. And that was their morning mantra. Who's got it better than us? And they'd all go, nobody. And then his dad would say, all right, let's go attack this day with an enthusiasm unknown to mankind. That's what it's like growing up a football coach's house. I can almost picture them putting their hands over the, over the cereal bowls and, you know, going, ah, I win, and then going out to school and wherever they went. But that was like growing up in the Harbaugh home. I couldn't help but think of this when I read this because it's almost like Paul's doing the same thing. Followers of Christ, who's got it better than us? Nobody. Because this is what he says. He, he says, uh, We've been, we have every spiritual blessing in Christ. And then in the subsequent verses, he begins to lay out why no one has it better than us. Nobody. Now, Paul can't be talking about uh, physical circumstances or physical blessings. The guy's in jail. No, he's talking about spiritual blessings. And you just read the, the language of Paul. And it's just like Paul is amazed that God would include him in his spiritual family. Sometimes, you know, Christians can get the idea, oh man, I'm like doing God a favor to be a part of his family. Uh, we'll read Ephesians and we'll discover, especially next week, that's not the true. true. I mean, we are privileged to know God. And Paul, in humility and wonder, begins reflecting on what it means to be perfectly loved by God. And so what you don't know is verses 3 all the way to the section we read is one sentence. It's just like he was just so full, he just began to pour it out. And apparently he didn't take a breath because it's just one run-on sentence. And it just starts to flow. Verses 4 and 5, he says, who's got it better than us? Nobody. God has loved us. God has chosen us. In Christ to be holy. God has decided, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. This is something that he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure to bring us into his family. And so Paul begins to say, Who's God better than us? Nobody. God has chosen us to be a part of his own family. He decided to do this. He's adopted us. Now, if you anybody have like a brother or a sister or something like that? Yeah, I mean, you, you didn't have a choice with your family. I mean, you're like, okay, I'm a caster, so I got a sister. That's what, that was my deal growing up. Yeah, but but with what, God, what he's talking about here is God adopted us. In other words, he chose us, and he went through all it took to adopt us into his family, and it gave him great pleasure. He got excited about it. You ever planned like a surprise party for somebody or maybe you got like a gift for someone's birthday or for Christmas and you're just like, oh man, they're going to love this so much. But then you had to wait like 10 more days till their birthday or, or Christmas or, or something like that. It's almost like that's the spirit of God here. It's like he had to sit around and wait for that time to finally arrive. He knew you before he created the world. And then he had to wait and wait and wait to finally get you into home. We have families who have adopted children in our, our, our congregation. And it's the same story. It's a beautiful story. It's like, oh, no, it's not going to work out. Oh, yes, it's not. We're on. We're off. We're on. We're off. 
And then finally, they get to go, and they get to bring the child home, and they're so excited. The first Sunday, they show up with that baby or that child, and I mean, they're just glowing. That's the spirit of God adopting us. He had to wait and wait and wait. But it brought God great pleasure to adopt us into his family, especially in light of how he had to adopt us. And so verses 7 and 8 says, He's so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son. And he forgave our sins and showed his kindness. To buy back, he bought us with the blood of his son. Uh, Maybe your translation says he redeemed us, which is the same thing, to buy back. It's a buyout. In Africa, when they're trying to express what it means to be redeemed or, or bought. Uh, there are some tribes that use a phrase, God took our heads out. I'm told, God took our heads out. That's the phrase. It goes back to the awful slave trading days when captured slaves were chained with these heavy iron collars around their neck and they're, they're chained to one another. And as the slaves passed through a village, a chief may notice in that line of slaves, a friend. And he would pay the slave trader, either gold, silver, furs, or something, for that friend's release. And then the prisoner would be redeemed. They would unhook the collar, and they would take his head out and refasten the collar, and they would be redeemed. Buyout. Now, this illustration breaks down here because when God looked at us, you know, the chief saw a friend and his heart was stirred. But when God looked upon us and our brokenness, he didn't see a friend. He saw an enemy because the Bible says, for all have sinned, all have fallen short of God's standards, that we are God's enemies because we have rebelled against his holy standards and against his authority in our life. And so God looked at us, we were his enemies. Yet he made peace with us. Not only did he, like, release us from the collar, he didn't, like, say, okay, you're free, go ahead, you know, go away. He says, I want to bring you into my family. I want to adopt you. Isn't that amazing? I just want to start singing Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Awesome. Awesome. In fact, I can't hit all this. I'll hit at the end, but he, he says, like, verse 3, all praise to God. Verse 6, he says, and so we praise God. I mean, he's just like, oh, that's good. Oh, praise God. Okay, here's something else that's good about God. Oh, praise God. I mean, it's just kind of the spirit of everything here. I love it. So he, he took us who were his enemies. He redeemed us. He, he bought us with the blood of his own son so that we could be a part of his family. He displayed his incredible generosity. Maybe I'm a little bit cynical. I just go, why would he do that? What's his angle? Yeah, we look at people, they got an angle. Or many times they do. (laughs) You look at God, you can't think that way because he's not like you or me. God would do that because he's God. It's his character. It's his nature. God loves justice. And God loves mercy. And because he's merciful... He can't help but look at you and look at me in our broken condition and not be moved to want to do something. But he's not like me where I just feel bad and I don't do anything. He feels bad and he did something. 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. It doesn't say that God has love. It says God is love. And so God's love means that it's going to compel him to take action for the good and best interest of another. And so Jesus Christ, he knew in Christ Jesus, God the Father knew that through Christ, he could make us free. So I'm like, okay, I can free these guys, but it's going to cost me my son. And he said, are you in? And Jesus said, I'm in. And they made, the, they made that plan. And so Jesus, Jesus went, he suffered, he died, he bled, he was tortured. And the Father had to watch that happen. Yet in Christ, he forgave us, and he brought us into his family. Praise be to God. 
And so verses 9 and 10 says that this was part of God's mysterious plan. Isaiah 45, it says that God works in mysterious ways. And this is part of his mysterious plan. But then he comes out and says it. This is his plan. To bring everything together under the authority of Christ. See, there is one point in time on our planet when God created everything and everything was beautiful. Love flowed like water. There was unity, there was love, there was peace. And it's all under the authority of God. But then we rebelled against God. And all the brokenness we see in this, on the planet, it, it, it's here. It's now. But God's not like going, oh man, it really stinks how that turned out. Wrong. God's got a plan. And his plan is, I'm going to fix it. And he brought Christ. And now he, he has given the bridge so that we can come across what separates us from God and be a part of his family and live under the authority of Christ. Because one day the Bible says that Christ will return with his angels and he will judge the quick and the dead. And for those who have received this offer to be a part of his family, to receive Christ and his salvation, the Bible says that we're going to live with him for eternity. It's beautiful and it's wonderful. Verse 11 says that uh, we're going to receive an inheritance from God. Verses 13 and 14 says that we receive the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of the future blessings and a foretaste of eternal life and the power of God. I love that about the Holy Spirit. I, um, I really enjoy having spiritual conversations with people. And I study and read uh, what's called apologetics or just evidences or reasons why we believe, evidences of God. And so I love talking to people uh, about you know, what might be a barrier to their belief. And I'm just so blessed when someone opens up their heart to start talking about that kind of thing with me. But sometimes a person comes to a place where, okay, I see these evidences, I see creation, I see the order of it, um, I see justice and love and all these, these things, but they say, I just, how can I know for sure? How can I know for sure? Friend, uh, if, if, that's your, if that's your heart right now, you can't know for sure just based on the evidence alone. It'll take you to a point in time where you realize, okay, this really makes sense. Jesus had these claims. There's these evidences about him. He's either, a, he's either Lord, he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. But you have to come to a place, and the Bible says you have to do this. You have to take a step of faith and in belief say, all right, I believe this is true. Then what happens is the Bible says if this is done in humility and with, with sincerity, and you receive Christ, the Spirit comes to dwell within you. And I don't know how many times I've had this conversation with people. They say, you know, I wasn't so sure at first, but now I am sure. Oh, did you find some new evidence? No, not really. I mean, I just, I, I asked Christ in my life. And I just, I don't know, I can't explain it. I, I just know. I just know it's true. And then what I see is, they go, um, I, I just, I look at things differently. I just don't think the way I used to think. And, and I see people differently. Yeah, that is the power of God through his spirit dwelling in you. The Bible says that we need to be filled with the spirit every day. But when a person takes that step of faith and says, okay, Lord, I want to receive you into my life. I don't know exactly what I'm doing but I want you in my life, the Holy Spirit will come and he will begin showing you what to do next and you will begin to know. It will just become true. Because it is true. Can't explain it. But you and I enjoy things that we can't explain, don't we? I can't explain electricity. I can't explain how I can talk on my cell phone and somehow someone across the world can hear me. I can't explain that, but I can enjoy it. And there's a lot of things in life. You just can't explain it. Like 
I really can't explain my computer half the time because it does things. But I can enjoy it sometimes. And that's the way it is with God. Is No, you can't fully understand the ways and the wonders of God. But by faith, you can receive Christ and we can enjoy him. That's what Paul's getting at. It's like, oh, it's just so great. And so in verses 15 through 23, I didn't read them to you, but the rest of this chapter, Paul seems to realize, oh, man, I just can't explain it to him. And so he just starts praying. Oh, God, help him. Help him to understand. Help him understand and have spiritual wisdom uh, so they can know you. They can grow in the knowledge of who you are. And then he starts praying, God, Help them to uh, understand the hope that they can have because they've been called, they've been adopted, they're, they're part of the family. Oh, God, help them to understand what it means to be part of the family of God. Oh, God, help them. And then he starts saying, uh, oh, God, help them to understand the incredible greatness of, of your power that, that raised Jesus from the dead. That's the same power that they have through the Spirit living within them. Oh, God, help them to understand their inheritance. Oh, God, help them to understand the beauty and the wonder of the church. And it's just like, he's like a frustrated guy trying to write a letter about something that's just too big to, to, uh, to express and maybe even to understand, at least not fully. And so, uh, you know, we put it all together. We praise God for every spiritual blessing. We've been chosen by God. He wanted us. He wants you. He wants you. We're adopted. We've been redeemed. We've escaped our slavery, whatever it is that enslaves us. We have this glorious inheritance just, just waiting on us, and it's a foretaste of that, and that glory and that beauty and that love and that joy. We get the Holy Spirit who fills us with the love of God and his presence and the peace that everything's going to be okay. Why would you not want that? Oh, I love it. And so I, as I look at the kind of world we live in, imagine yourself as that little acorn, you know, and it's like I'm trying to explain and we're trying to probe and send our tap roots down into this uh, love of God. You know, we want to get grounded in the right thing. We want to get grounded in God and his love. And so our tap roots going down, but your, your, your shoot's going up. Now you're breaking out of the nice, warm, safe earth. <laughs> And now you're, you're out in the, the weather. Now you're in, out in the harsh conditions. Well, if your roots are right, I think there are three amazing benefits for you because we're going to leave this nice kumbaya church service and then we're going to walk out and get smacked in the face <laughs> with, with a lot of stuff. Let me, let me share three things I just think are awesome. If this is true... <laughs> And if we receive God's perfect love in Christ, and we just let God love us, and we just begin to reflect and think about how awesome God is, then I think uh, there's three things that just be awesome for us. One is I can rest. I can rest and breathe a sigh of relief. I can relax. I'm loved. I'm accepted as I am. God loves me just the way I am. He loves me enough to not leave me this way, but he accepts me where I am, for who I am right now. I no longer have to prove myself to matter to someone else. I never have to try to continually please people who seem to be unpleasable. I don't have to try to pacify someone who just seems like they're never going to be satisfied, no matter what I do. I don't have to feel the pressure to be someone that I'm not. Because we're all sinners. Next week, we'll talk about that more. And the ground is level at the foot of the cross. It's not like when we're all standing on the cross and we, we're standing there and Christ is dying for our sins, like there's this VIP sense, you know, center section, like, okay, you guys aren't quite as bad as someone else. I mean, God's eyes, sin is sin. 
and so we can rest. Jesus says, come on to me. If you're weary, you're burdened, come to me. I'll give you rest. You can rest in God freeing you from sin. You can rest in uh, the reality of, of who God is and how much he loves you and, and whose you are. That's so important. Who is God? And whose am I? And so I, I just recommend that you just take this chapter of Ephesians and just read it over and over and over again. Paul was so frustrated. He was just trying to express it. I'm trying to express it. It's just like you got to just sit with it and just let it minister to you as the Spirit helps you to understand just who's got it better than us? Nobody. Nobody. Uh, another benefit, I think, is not only can I rest, I can breathe a sigh of relief, I can relax. Another thing is I can resist the false messaging around me because the world is marketing and messaging all kinds of things at me. And so when I feel the pull, like I got to start performing or I got to conform to the worldly value systems, I can be reminded, I can remind myself through this passage of who God is and whose I am. So when the voices start up, might start up tomorrow morning, you wake up and the voices of condemnation just begin screaming at you. You're a failure. You're a failure. You're a failure. You can't do it. You can't do it. You never could do it. You never will do it. Or you're not worth it. You're not worth it. All that squawking noise, you can just block it out by saying, whoa, wait a second, wait a second. That's not true. On the authority of the written word of God, the revealed word of truth, I am a beloved child. I have been chosen. I have been called. I have received the spirit. I have an inheritance. I am loved. And it was written and read, that love. Don't talk to those voices. I, some people like say, I told the devil this. I told that evil spirit that. Don't do that. That's not biblical, by the way. Read the book of Jude. Uh, when, when Michael was, was going against the evil forces, he didn't, say, Lord, he didn't say, I rebuke you. No, he said, the Lord rebuke you. Don't talk to those voices. Don't talk to the demons. Don't talk to the evil one. Say, Lord, deal with it. Please deal with it. Thank you. I am a beloved child of God. Thank you for your love. And God will love you, and he will take care of all those voices for you. Because you don't need more work to do. You just need to trust. The last benefit, I can rest, I can resist those screaming voices. I can rejoice. I can rejoice and worship God. Verse 3, all praise to God the Father, he said. Verse 6, we praise God for his glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Verse 14, he did this so that we would praise him and glorify him. Everybody's praising something. Everyone's getting excited about something. People are throwing their money at stuff. They're throwing their time. They're throwing their energy. They're, throwing, uh, they're, they're, they're just talking about it. And so we are made to to give our attention, our energy to something. We're praising something. But here's the deal. Our hearts are filled with joy and happiness when we give praise and thanksgiving to God. In fact, when I get that going and I get that rolling, I feel great. Why? Because it's what I was meant to do. I'm in the sweet spot of God's will. This is why he created me, so that I would give him praise, so I can enjoy him as part of my purpose in life. And so when I enjoy what God has done, and I express my enjoyment to him in whatever way, it could be art, it can be a song, it can be a prayer, whatever it is, you're in your sweet spot. And you're living out one of God's great purposes for your life. 
the worship and enjoyment of him. I can rest. I can resist those voices. I can rejoice. And so uh, when you and I are rooted in what's right, then we can uh, find our foundation in the unfathomable love of God, the unconditional love of God. You know, there's a lot of people that are looking for love. Do you know that? Sometimes we forget. You know, that, that guy who's difficult or that woman or that, 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 that teenager or that, that kid or whatever. But a lot of times, the old phrase, hurt people, hurt people. A lot of times, what, what's going on there is they're looking for love. We all need love. Because God is love, and we need God. And so as you begin to reflect and as you begin to rest in what you've heard, oh, man, it was just so hard to, to give this message because there's so much more. But when you begin to absorb it into who you are, and it becomes your identity. It's what defines you. I'm a beloved child of God. I'm a beloved child of God. I am a beloved child of God. And we understand that, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. No matter what my family background is, I'm in the family of God. No matter what my dad said to me or what that aunt said to me, I'm in the family of God. I'm perfectly loved. It, it just it will change your life. But the cool thing is that I wouldn't be surprised as you begin to absorb this, God will bring someone into your life that He wants you to share it with, in your own words, in your own ways. And he'll bring someone across your path looking for what God has given to you so that they can experience what he has given to us. Because we live, in, we live in difficult days. We live in evil days. Remember that last week? But in the midst of these evil days, there's opportunity. There's opportunity to reflect and remind ourselves of who God is and whose we are. And there's the opportunity to not only know God, but to make him known. And so as you leave here today, you're an apostle. You're a spokesman. And as you're dealing with all the harsh conditions of your life, you're an oak tree. I mean, you've got roots that are going deeper and deeper. And the deeper you get into God's love, and the more you will relax the more the joy of the Lord will be your strength, people will start saying, what, what's different about you? You say, well, <laughs> it's not about me. It's about him. Give me, give me a minute sometime and I'll talk about it. Let's talk about it right now. Ooh, game on. Who's got it better than us? Nobody. So guys, let's go into this world with an enthusiasm unknown mankind because it's not hype it's real hope i've not stopped thanking god for you and i pray for you constantly asking god the glorious father of our lord jesus christ to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in the knowledge of god i pray that your hearts will be flooded with the light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he has called his holy people who are rich, have a rich and glorious inheritance. Oh, thank you, God. I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. He's far above any ruler or authority or power or anything else, not only in this world, but in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. Oh God, as we begin to sing and respond to the message and the revelation of who you are, I pray that you would fill us 
with yourself. Amen.